wonderful place called Church of Manitoba, where we grew up, and uh, and this is our home. Okay, so welcome to my town. Okay, because I own it. Okay, so. Did you tell them to do this when I talked to you? Yeah, really the dog's talking. They do it as soon as people arrive, because they're like, we don't want to go okay, who's going to get to go this morning? Meanwhile, we have groups at 9, 10, 11, 1, 2, 3, and 7.30 tonight. Wow. Okay? We're very popular for some reason. Good for you. Okay, but uh, maybe maybe because we're the only one. <laughs> I'm okay with whatever I want. That's yeah. great. But you're in Churchill, Manitoba, okay? So this is a very special place in the world, okay? Time Magazine just named one of the top, the top 50 amazing places on this planet, and Churchill comes in at number five. Woo! Wow. Okay, so, and on the Lonely Planet, we're top 10, okay? So that's pretty cool, right? Cool. The reason why Churchill comes in that category is because there's no other place like Churchill. There's four ecosystems that surround Churchill. Okay, you're in the boreal forest. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Treaty 5 territory, which means it's the largest treaty, treaty territory in Manitoba. Okay, so you're in the boreal forest. This is the homeland of the Cree and the Métis. This is where the tree line ends. It borders right on Churchill. Just to the north of us is the Taiga, which is the homeland of the Dene peoples, whose lands border right on Churchill. And then just to the north of us is the Tundra, which is the homeland of the Inuit people, and their lands border right on Churchill. And then we have that fantastic other ecosystem, the biggest bay in the world, the Hudson's Bay. Okay, so that's what makes us special because we have all the animals of all four ecosystems. We have 600 species of birds that come through here. Okay, to, to, to nest as they're going north, and we have a whole ton here. This is a birder's paradise. We also have all the medicines and the plants of all four ecosystems. So when we're foraging and we're harvesting in the fall with berries, we can go get every one of them from every ecosystem. What are the four? Boreal, tundra, aquatic? Uh, taiga. Taiga? What's taiga? Taiga is stumpy, black tree, swampy, sand eskery area. It's a transition from the boreal forest to the tundra. Okay? So, where was I? Talk about plants yeah. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah the plants, plants and everything, right? So we border raid on Churchill, and uh, and we also have uh, you know the aurora borealis mm -hmm. here in Churchill, which is I know a lot of countries and a lot of other towns say that they're the capital, but I know that they're lying <laughs> <laughs> because this is where the National Research Council and air, from all over the states and everywhere, all the scientists came here. And when I was a kid growing up in the '60s and the '70s. They fired over 3,000 rockets into the Aurora to figure out what it was, because I could have told them, they could have just asked me, and I would have said, that's my ancestors dancing in the sky, <laughs> that's it, right? Yes. So, you know, but uh, because that Aurora Dome is right over Churchill, and we have Aurora 300 days a year, mm -hmm. if the skies are clear. So, you know, like, it's a pretty amazing place on this planet. Mm -hmm. It's also where, you know, back in the day, when Churchill was, well, Churchill, when this continent was discovered, right? You know, you know when the first Europeans arrived here? 1619, when Jens Monk from Denmark came into the bay here and he <clears throat> came into the Churchill River and he planted his flags on our shores and said, this is New Denmark. Mm. Luckily, he had a horrific experience because <laughs> he got stuck here for the winter and they all died except for three of them, and then they sailed one of the ships back to Denmark to tell the tale, and they never came back. <laughs> or else we might all be speaking a different language over here. <laughs> okay? But, uh, you know, 40, 50 years later, the Brits showed up with their ship, ships, and they landed in the Churchill River here. And they met the people of these lands, and that's why I say indigenous people have been doing tourism for hundreds of years. <laughs> okay? And we continue on with that. Okay? And uh, they showed them around, and they seen the riches of this land, and they planted their flags on our shores and said, this is Rupert's land. At 155 miles south of us, at the mouth of the Hayes River, they uh, built York Factory. Did you ever hear of the historic York Factory? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. So that was in business for over 270 years, till 1956 or 57, when it was finally closed down. Okay. But five years later, I think it was 1689, they built the first Fort Churchill. 
a wooden fort just up the Churchill River here, and that's how Churchill got its name after John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough, who was the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company. So the Hudson's Bay Company went into the fur trade business, right? The, lot, lot, the furthest furs that came through Churchill was from the Rockies. Okay, that's how how far, how far they were they, the, they were going, right? Okay, to bring stuff out to the coast here. The French came over, but they came in from the east. They came in through what is now Quebec, where we get our French Canadians, and then they came to southern Manitoba, where they met these beautiful indigenous women, and they started to make Métis babies, in my language means mixed. And through those 270 years, the Métis people developed their own language and their own culture. That's why the, in Canada, within our borders, we recognize three indigenous groups of people. First Nations, okay, like my wife from the first, from the Cree Nation, and uh, the, the Inuit people, like my good friends up north in Nunavut here, you know, the Tutus and the Hicksas who I grew up with, okay, they were here before discovery, and then the Métis people who were born during the fur trade, okay? So all over the west, you'll see this flag flying. This is the flag of the Métis people that was flown by the Métis people 150 years before Canada was even Canada. And what it means to us is two nations joining together to form a new nation in the middle that will go on forever. And during those 270 years, the Métis people took the best of both worlds and they made their own world. They were really important in opening up this whole country because they could travel between two worlds because they had relatives in both, right? They worked for both the Northwest Company and then the Hudson's Bay Company. So by the year 1860, there was 8,000 Métis people in the Assiniboine when they did a census. Okay? And there was the English Métis and the French Métis because the Scots and the Irish and everyone got introduced into the, into the Métis people. So then there's the historic Métis people. To be a member of the Métis Nation, you have to do your ancestors book, okay? And through my grandmother, because the Métis people kept vast records in their day from their European side, I can trace my Métis ancestry to my 11th great-grandparents in the 1500s. Wow. Okay, all the way back to French. So we're from the French Métis side. Now, there's a big history of the Métis people out of the West, especially when the fur trade was waning, you know, and... Uh, and, you know, the, the only civil war that happened in Canada was when the, the Canadians battled the Métis people for the West, okay? But it's a, a long story, and I don't have time to get into it, because I could be here for an hour talking about what happened to my people. But this book, The Northwest is Our Mother, is at the museum in town here. It's available online. If you want to take a picture of the book and you want to read the history of the Métis people, and this reads like a story. So I've read a lot of books over my day about the Métis people, and this is the best book I've ever read. Okay? So, please, if you want to learn more about my people, because my people disappeared for almost 100 years. Okay? So our resurgence just came in the 80s, and this tells the story of the Métis people from the beginnings to where we are today. Okay? So... They took the best of both worlds back in the day. And from the European side, one of the other things we took was government. Métis people love government, okay? We have a huge government in Manitoba. We have 38,000 citizens of the Métis nation within Manitoba. And we elect our government every four years, just like everybody else does. They go to Winnipeg, they form a government, and they have all their departments, just like a regular government, you know, health care, language, child welfare, you know, all, all the same ones, housing, you know, conservation, you know, so we have a big government, okay? We're an industrious nation. We look after our own people. We don't get any, we don't, we're not like my wife who's Cree, who gets free dental and free, free health care and all the stuff that she gets. Us Métis people, we look after ourselves. And we look after ourselves as a nation, you know, especially about 10 years ago, we were thinking like, what can we do to help our elders, you know? So we started to buy pharmacies. You know, and now we educate our kids to be pharmacists. So we look after ourselves. If you're 65 years of age or older, you get to uh, get free uh, medication. The other thing we wanted to do is because housing is getting out of reach of a 
a lot of people, especially our children and our great grandchildren. The Métis Nation helped 80 families get young families get their own homes last year by giving them the down payment and the closing costs. Okay. And they signed contracts wow. to stay within that house for 10 wow. years. Like, like we're a very industrious nation. Yeah. We just bought two huge buildings. At, uh, we have the Bank of Montreal building in downtown Winnipeg, and we just bought the Bank of Nova Scotia building from the 1800s, and we're retrofitting them. Like, our Métis Nation is very, we have down goose plants all over the place. We have all kinds of stuff, okay? So we're a very industrious nation, and we pay taxes. But that's why we go to the government and we want some of our money back for our taxes mm -hmm. for the services that you know so that we do so we're always canvassing the government <laughs> but i grew up in churchill hunting fishing and trapping because from the indigenous side we're a land-based people and that's what basically got us in trouble back in the day when canada was getting uh, the west from the hudson's bay company and, and the british you know when they handed it over when they wanted out of the fur trade because the fur trade was dying. <coughs> we weren't farmers. In all that rich Red River Valley area in the Assiniboia, the west or the east wanted that for the Ontario settlers, but there was one people standing in their way, was the Métis people, because we were land-based people. Back in the fur trade, we were the freighters. You know, we resupplied all the trading posts in the summer on the canoe brigades with the, we were the voyageurs, you know. We were the dog mushers in the winter, resupplying everything and bringing the, all the goods and services out to the coast. Like we, we were a land-based people. We were the buffalo hunters. <coughs> so, when I was young, when I was growing up, I've been harvesting since I could hold a fishing rod or set a rabbit snare. But I was always taught that all animals have souls like we do, whether you're a fish, a moose, or a goose. And I was always taught that the creators put the animals here for us to nourish our bodies and our bodies so I was always taught to harvest with respect we don't take more than we need we always share with our elders I had an elder the other day ask me did you get a moose this fall yet and I said no I didn't get a chance to get out but I'm going before Christmas don't forget me <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean so I have a group of elders that I look after whether I'm fishing or whatever I just had two elders out here just before the season started to uh, I cooked them up to uh, two trout over the fire in the teepee, and we had a we, we had lunch out here. So this is the things that we do, uh, and, uh, and to give back to our elders because indigenous culture shared. Now, when I get a rabbit that goes in my rabbit snare or a fish bites my hook, I believe those animals are giving themselves to me. So I always spend time with the animals I harvest, and I thank them for their sacrifice. And I always thank the creator for creating the animals. And that's the philosophies I use when I raise my sled dogs. Because I believe that dogs are the greatest gift to us humans from the animal world. There is no other animal on this planet that has a relationship with humans like dogs do. Dogs have hundreds and hundreds of jobs to help us poor humans every day. And my dogs are no different than a C&I dog or a herding dog or a retriever dog. My dogs are sled dogs. We see lots of miles together, my, me and my dogs. I've been in 16 long distance races up to 400 miles long. 2010, I, I went from Churchill to Winnipeg by my dog team. I left here on January 3rd at 40 below, and this is me coming into Winnipeg on January 23rd. It took me 20 days when I left Churchill and I ran all the way to Winnipeg. The whole province followed that run. It was a historic run. I did it for, for to kick off the uh, centennial year for our province, and I also did it to create awareness for the Métis people within Manitoba, the Red River Métis. And, and there was news crews out here from CBC, APTN, Global, everyone was here to film me as I went and started my journey to Winnipeg and how it was built was this Métis dog musher was going to travel by a traditional method by dog sled all the way through the province to a homecoming to my ancestral homeland at the Forks in downtown Winnipeg because my latest, my oldest land script in my genealogy is 1795 from down. Okay? Right after this picture was taken, I was escorted down the Assiniboine River by place with their sirens going on their skidoos. People were on the bridges cheering us on. People <laughs> followed my whole run down. In and out of those communities, the whole communities came out and lined up along the highway to, to cheer us on as we... We're going into Winnipeg. Planes were landing on skis out on the lake to bring me a sandwich and a coffee and that <laughs> me out on the lake. 
Even Chief oh. Ovid Meckerdy, I was sleeping under a cell tower 50 miles from Grand Rapids inside my sleigh with my dogs all on straw lined out. And someone kicked my sleigh in the middle of the night. And I, I said, who is it? And he goes, it's Ovid, your wife's cousin. <laughs> He's up the bag. Hey, Ovid, what's up? He goes, is that you, Dave? I go, who the hell do you think's running out here in the wilderness with a dog team? He said, I've been looking for you. We've got a crew out making a trail for you to come into our cultural campground at Grand Rapids, and we want you to spend a couple days with us so our kids can come out and meet you and see the dogs. And we got a cook and a fire cutter, and we're going to keep your tent warm for you, and all that kind of good stuff. So the whole province followed that run. And when I rounded the corner at the forks by police escort, to my surprise, my dogs almost turned around to go back home because 700 people roared as we got around the corner. They had a community feast for 700 people at the Forks. The mayor and the premier and everyone was there to greet us and congratulate us on such a historic run. And they presented me with that plaque because I stopped in all those communities to talk to the kids about my passion for the outdoors because in 2009, the province had made me one of 12 in motion champions in the province to talk to the school kids about my passion for the outdoors and my passion to my dogs. So my connection is deep to this land through my dog team. I've also been to RV at Nunavut seven times across the Hudson Bay to go visit my friends. <laughs> I've counted five polar bears on the flow edge when I'm way out on the flow edge with my dog team. I've run through herds of 5,000 caribou. I've had wolves running 30 yards off from my team. You know what I mean? I've had lots of, lots of experience on the land. I've survived blizzards going through the ice with my dog team. I have lots of stories. I could regale you for three hours, okay? But I do, all I do is I ha my dogs and me, that's my connection to the land of me and my dogs. When I ran to Winnipeg, I was like, who do I take on this historic run? So I took all my old dogs. My youngest dog was nine and my oldest dog was 13. Okay, so I wanted to share that with them because I know dogs don't live long enough. This is my memory sash. All the dogs that have come and gone over the years from the time that I started dog sledding over 20 years ago with my own team. I've always grew up with sled dogs, of course, in the 60s and the 70s. There were lots of dog teams around Churchill. I always helped my, my friend Robert McDonald with his dad and his dog. So, but this is my dog. I've got 43 dogs out there, okay, ranging in the age from 1 to 15 years old. When my dogs live with me, they live with me for their whole life. Over 60% of my kennels are rescues, and I rescued 11 dogs in the last year. We rarely have puppies. I haven't had puppies for four years, but we are going to have puppies on October 26th. Okay? Uh, one of those little females that we rescued, really nice female, Ivy. I, I looked around, and I had all my 11-year-olds there, Casper. Uh, I kept him intact because all my other females are spayed, and 80% of my males are neutered. I have no one from that line left after those dogs are gone. So I did a breeding with the two dogs, and we're expecting puppies on October 26th for their puppies. Okay? If you take a picture of our social media and you follow us on Instagram or, or Facebook, we will be posting pictures as soon as it happens. And you will keep up to date with all the news that happens at my tent. Okay? Now, I raise my dogs on love and respect, which means there's no hitting dogs in my kennel and no yelling and screaming at dogs because dogs are energetic beings. They're most soulful being on the planet, and no dog deserves to be treated with disrespect or, or abuse. Okay? So, dogs know when we're sad. They know when we're mad. They know when we're grumpy. They know when we're sick. There's dogs out there that can sense when they're human and the grocery store is going to faint and they get them to sit down so they don't bash their heads. There's dogs that sense energy when a person is going to have a seizure and they get them to lay down. There's even dogs that can detect cancer in people. I don't know any other animal on this planet or any other human that can do that. That's how special they are. Okay? So my dogs are special because I got a whole bunch of different dogs out there. Okay, when I get these rescues, I have to figure out who they are. Not every human's a marathoner, and not every dog's a marathoner. I don't make dogs do anything they don't want to do. I have dogs out there that just like to do tours. I have dogs out there that don't like to run five or ten miles. And then they're like, I'm done. 
<laughs> I try to find a core group of dogs, though, that like to travel long distance with me, and I always love running 20, 30, 40, 50 mile training runs. A lot of fun, 30 below, 40 below, through blizzards. I've been 30 miles from, from the cabin here out training and a blizzard hits. Now my old leader now is 15, Thor. He's fading fast and I'm really gonna miss him when he's gone, but I would get in my sleigh and I'd say, Thor, let's go home. And I wouldn't know I'm home until I'm in front of the cabin here. Wow. He knows how to take me home. I trust that dog with my life on many journeys. I'll see. <laughs> but anyway, but uh, you know, dogs just don't live long enough, you know? And uh, he comes out and he's barking and he wants to go, but I know he can't even do a mile now. So I'm not going to take him out. But I go sit with him and spend time with him and love him up. Right? But that's what I do. I travel a lot with my dogs. I love to race. I even invented a race, the Hudson Bay Quest. Famous in the dog machine world. It's known as the toughest mid-distance race in North America because I make things tough. <laughs> There's no other race like it. It's not like the wimpy I did her on. <laughs> Every 40, 50 miles, you pull into a community, they bring you hot water, you get a resupply, go to train. In one checkpoint, they give you a seven course meal. You can get pizza or hamburgers. But this is 220 miles of wilderness, no resupply. And the dog machine world is known as the toughest mid distance race in North America. All different terrain, boreal forest, hills, barren lands, river work, flooding, overflow. Mm -hmm. I've had racers come from the States, young guys that were hot shots down there, coming at the back of the pack and I see them at the banquet and I go, hey, how was that? <laughs> they go, I got the trophy in the patch and That's all I'm right. not coming back, it was scary. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask you about the John Beer grease, you probably think that's just the uh, I got racers from there. Yeah. On the oh. Clown Lake, Lake Fracky and all my friends. Okay. The tough ones. Yeah. And if any racers from down there want to come, they have to say that they think they have the skills to do that. Yeah, do that. There's a lot of dog mushers that are mad at them because they want to come and challenge themselves, but they go, well, you got to go work on this and this and this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a survival race. Yeah. I've had a guy came from Northern Ontario who teaches Arctic survival to the military. He pressed his help button 30 miles from the finish line. Mm -hmm. You gotta be tough, okay? With frozen pen. Okay, you got some tough mushers down there in the States, those guys. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? They know how to travel, they know how to survive, they know how to, you know. At the halfway point, there's the only six hour mandatory rest. And like, I thought I was the only one that curled up with my dogs in the sleeping bag at 30 below, but there's Peter McClellan and Blake Freckin and and you know, Sean McCartney, you know? Mm -hmm. Ryan Anderson has come. I have a story about Ryan Anderson's first Hudson Bay Quest. Hot shot dog musher down. He's run the Bear Grease lots of times. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. First race, he scratched at the halfway point. He never scratched from a race in his life. Mm. It was minus 35 with a 60K win, so like oh, minus cool. 55. Yeah. You gotta know how to survive, but I kind of psyched them out. It's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's you know, it's a tough race. I'm afraid to say that it's the last one that ever happened was in 2019. Dog sledding is dying. I haven't been able to get enough people here. Dog mushers are recovering from COVID. I I tried to put it on twice, but I couldn't get enough racers here to work putting in a 220 mile trip. Okay. No, just, no COVID. Really. just COVID. This didn't stop during COVID. Yeah. They all had to be fed yeah. and everything. You know, dog mushers don't have the money to travel right now. Right. Everyone's recovering from COVID. <coughs> just think of the Iditarod. Yeah. 80 teams before COVID. Last year, only 33 teams entered. Wow. This year, only 26 teams entered. Yeah. They're going to put a 1,000-mile trail in for 26 dog mushers. The Yukon Quest was a 1,000-mile race. They cut it in half now. Last year, they put a 500-mile trail in for seven dog racers. Seven? Wow. Everyone's getting out of dogs. Karen Hendrickson, everybody's getting out. They're tired of being poor. Okay? You can make more money bowling and throwing darts than you can dog sled racing. Mm -hmm. Ryan Reddington run, won the Iditarod last year. He got a whopping check of $40,000. It's 
It's nothing. That's not even your food bill for a year. It cost me $46,000 to feed these dogs last year. And every year through COVID. Okay, so we're recovering here. That's why you're all here. Yeah. <laughs> Dog mushers actually hate people. <laughs> but I like people to know a little bit about a dog team before we get uh, out on the Iditta Mile dog sled ride. It's not the Iditta ride. <laughs> you get a taste of dog sledding. And you get a chance to have a beautiful souvenir because Dan's here to take your picture when we're on the trail. He edits them, okay? And then uh, he's going to put an iPad there. And when you're done your run, you put your email address in there and press notify me and you get all your pictures. You can laugh at the people that aren't looking too good. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can buy a picture and get a big canvas for behind your couch or an 8 by 10 okay? Or if you don't like yours, you can pick somebody else's. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but uh, basically that's a dog team. Now, I raise my dogs on love and respect, okay? But when you build a dog team, you have to make sure every dog in there likes each other. Mm. You have to know who they like to work with. I've got hundreds of stories of dogs that work together down the trail and encourage each other and get through blizzards and do everything together and, and cheer each other up, okay? You have to know if they're right-handed or left-handed. You have to know what job do they like to do. Are they lead dogs, point dogs, team dogs, or wheel dogs? Okay, so... There's different jobs for dogs to do in a dog team, and I like dogs to have fun doing their job. The rarest dog in the dog world is a lead dog. Lead dogs are rare. Out of 43 dogs, I only have eight dogs that I would trust to take me on a journey. We call them command leaders. Okay, we talk to them. Okay? So when we're, we talk to them, eh? I'm from back here. I'm at the back of the slate. These are the basic commands of dog sledding. When I want to go, I say, hike, hike, means let's go. When I want to stop, I say, whoa. When I want to go faster, I say, hurry up now. Pick it up, means pick up the speed. When I want to go slower, I say, easy, easy, means to slow down. When I want to turn right, I say, G. When I want to go left, I say, ha. When I want to go straight ahead, I say, straight ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then the big command in dog sledding is on by. <laughs> on by. That means we're not chasing that rabbit through the bush with a dog tail. <laughs> go on by. On by means we're not going to go and that family's picnic 20 yards off the trail. Okay? On by means when I pass another dog team, we're not going to visit. Okay? Go on by. Okay? The next two dogs in my team are uh, more and more experienced dogs. They eh? All the brains in the front, all the brawn in the back. They're all different. In my race team, though, I like to take four leaders with me because I have leaders that are better at different jobs than other leaders. I just switch lead dogs for different jobs. Who's good at leading us on glare ice? Who's good at crossing a flooded creek? Who's good at setting a fast pace on a hard trail like we did with this team at the last checkpoint, a 50-mile run? I finally let them run through the night, and we did 50 miles in four hours and 20 minutes. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, you have to set yourself up. You have to make sure that your dogs have the experience or are good at that job. And I just switch lead dogs for different jobs. The next four dogs in my team are called team dogs. Team dogs are awesome dogs, superstar athletes, but they only like to work from within the team. They want no responsibility. <laughs> I had a family here yesterday from Texas, and the lady goes, I need team dogs. <laughs> and the very back two dogs are called wheel dogs. Wheel dogs are the hardest working dogs in any dog team. They're the closest to the sled, they're the closest to the weight. They feel everything this thing dishes out all day long. Okay? Next thing I have to do is I have to fuel them. Sled dogs eat a lot of food. When we're running all day like we are every day now to try to raise enough money for our kennel, They'll burn 12 to 15,000 calories a day. Wow. We wow. have to figure out how to trick them to eat sometimes. Lobo out there has been leading and he's been a great job. He hasn't been eating for a couple of days, so I went and got canned dog food from the store to mix in with his kibble and his chicken and everything. And then he finally ate a big meal this morning. Okay? But we have to figure out how to get those calories into them. 
even when I'm racing. When I'm racing or training, I feed my dogs every two hours. I keep pounding calories into them all day long. Just like an Olympic athlete eats five meals a day. I bring in kibble. This, I got 65 bags on the way. They look like professional dog food. They have to make it. You can't buy it in the store. It's 30% protein and 25% fat and has 5,000 calories per kilogram. Wow. Okay. By the time it lands here through three shipping companies from New Brunswick, it's about $90 a bag. I go through a bag and a half a day right now. Okay. That's why you're all here. I went through 15,000 pounds of kibble last year. The other thing they love is I got in, uh, I got in on Friday was their first ton of frozen ground chicken. Now, now it's supposed to be below zero, so my freezer's here so I can keep this. So it's into my trailer all covered in a million blankets, trying to keep it cold over the last few days. But they love meat, okay? Last year they ate 15,000 pounds of frozen ground chicken for a grand total of about $46,000, okay? The other thing is, I have to be a doggy physiotherapist. I know doggy yoga, doggy massage, doggy chiropractic, and I'm a foot specialist. But the biggest thing to be the best dog musher in the whole world is you have to be the world's best cheerleader. Listen to your, listen to your mushers today when they're on the back, giving you your identical experience. They're going to be encouraging these dogs and making it fun. Okay. Now that when you ride on our carts, I've designed them the same way I designed the sled. Okay? The first person sits in the front of the basket like this. We'll cover you with a blanket, strap you in. You can videotape your run. You can have a lot of fun running here. And then uh, <coughs> Dan will be around the corner and you can pose for your picture. <laughs> okay? And, uh, or you can look still <laughs> It's up to you. Okay? But uh, enjoy watching your five or six dogs work for you this morning as we go around. We don't need that many dogs because we're on wheels. Once you get it rolling, it's fine. Okay? The second person rides here like a dog musher. Okay? So when you're on here, it's going to feel like you're giving a ride, but you're not. Okay? Because you're going to have a dog musher with you. You can pose for your picture. Okay? Enjoy your ride. Pretend you're out in the wilderness. Okay? Listen to the panting of the dogs and the feet pitter pattering on the ground. It's a really spiritual thing for me whenever we uh, are out on the land, okay? And then we'll be on the back controlling your ride. Any questions? We're going to run four teams. I'm going to pick the first eight as soon as we get outside. I'll say you're number one, you're number two, you're number three, you're number four. Go to your carts, they'll get you on there. And then when they're gone, one, two, three, four, go stand by your side, okay? We'll get you off and then we'll get the other ones on and then we'll go around and we'll get you guys done in two runs because we got groups coming all day long. Okay? Let's get outside. I don't know. No, I have